Next, we're going to look at alternatives to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin uh, was the first you know, decentralized cryptocurrency. It was sort of the first successful cryptocurrency uh, that had the particular properties that it had. And a lot of people looked at Bitcoin and they said, okay, Bitcoin's great, uh, really like it, uh, but there's room for improvement. And the second thing uh, to, to realize about Bitcoin is we use the term Bitcoin to, rem to, to sort of think about different things, right? So Bitcoin is the name of the currency itself. Uh, Bitcoin can be used for the uh, protocol. Uh, and Bitcoin's also uh, sometimes used for the, the software that runs. And it's important to remember that Bitcoin at the end of the day, it's software. It's software that essentially creates something of value, uh, some sort of currency out of thin air. And in particular, because it's open source software, what people can do is they can just copy and paste that software and you can, you know, you could do this yourself. If you want your own kind of Bitcoin, you can rename it to whatever you want. You can just basically copy and paste the software uh, and, and now you can have your own Bitcoin. Uh, so what people did is um, they would do it. Now, if you start generating your own coins using your copy of Bitcoin, there's no guarantee that anyone will want to buy that, right? There's no guarantee that that would have some sort of real world value. Bitcoin does. Uh, so there are people who are willing to give you US dollars or Canadian dollars or euros or whatever for your for your Bitcoin. Uh, there's no guarantee that that market would establish for your coin. But what people did is uh, they, they would create these alternatives to Bitcoin where they would go in and they would tweak different aspects. So they said, well, we think that people will want to buy this because it's an actual improvement on Bitcoin. So it improves um, it improves some uh, aspect of Bitcoin. And most of these fall into a couple of broad categories. So this isn't going to be uh, comprehensive. So these are all your potential uh, improvements. Um, so the first thing that people would do uh, is they would tweak around they would tweak the um, consensus mechanism um, and so usually two ways uh, so the first thing that's very easy to tweak is uh, you can decrease the block interval. So for Bitcoin, it averages out to 10 minutes. That seems like a long time to wait. It seems like an overly conservative number. And so uh, a lot of these alternatives would uh, decrease the block interval. Um, some of them would also say, you know, this whole proof of work thing, you know, it works really good. Uh, but we don't like it. It uses a lot of electricity. Um, so maybe we can uh, replace proof of work with something different. Uh, and in general, there were a couple ways. Uh, so one is let's keep the work, but let's at least make it useful work. OK, so instead of computing these hash values that no one cares about and no one will ever use, uh, maybe we could have people uh, create, you know, use that computation to do something else. Now this is a lot harder than it seems because you need certain properties like uh, when the person, first off, the puzzle has to be hard. It has to be hard on average. You have to be able to pull instances of the puzzle out of thin air. Uh, and then the most important thing is that when you solve the puzzle, the person who looks at the solution should be able to verify immediately that it's correct without having to redo the work. And so a lot of work that you would want a computer to do just doesn't fall into those uh, sort of three categories of properties. So. Um, this is hard. The other thing is that the reason that we're basing it on computational work, you can think more generally, computational work is kind of a scarce resource. So if you had a different scarce resource, um, it could still be computational, like maybe it's memory instead of computational time because storage is, could be expensive as well. Um, so there's, there's some proposals that are, are based on storage, what's called proof of retrievability. Um, some people have looked at whether the currency itself, so the, the amount of currency you hold kind of influences how much say that you have in the consensus mechanism. Um, so these are, are sort of a broad umbrella term would be proof of stake. There's a lot to proof of stake. I could do an entire lecture on it. Um, probably won't, at least the first time through this course. But um, anyway, so there's all alternatives that, that drop it. Uh, another alternative uh, that you can do is because um, Bitcoin's consensus is related to Byzantine fault tolerance. It's actually kind of solving it using a different way. Um, if you can 
somehow control the nodes who are on your network and you can control the number of miners, uh, then you can switch back to a traditional BFT mechanism. Um, so that setting is sometimes called the permissioned setting, where you need permission to join the network. It's not running on the open internet the way that Bitcoin is working. Uh, this is suitable in some corporate environments. Um, and so uh, anyways, there's, there's a lot of interest in switching back to a standard BFT protocol that doesn't have the proof of work uh, under the assumptions that your environment changes from the open internet to a closed network. Um, so anyways, there's, there's lots of, of different uh, currencies that, that look at these kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot on the side of anonymity. So it turns out that uh, Bitcoin does not offer great anonymity. In fact, technically it doesn't offer anonymity at all. It, it offers something called pseudonymity. Uh, in particular, if, if you do, let's say that, that uh, I put up an address where you can donate uh, Bitcoin to me. Uh, these donations come over time. Anyone who looks at the blockchain, first off, if, if you look at, let's say I put it right here in the course notes, I won't actually do that, but let's say I put it in the course notes, everyone who watches the course knows it belongs to me now. So they know that that's Jeremy Clark's uh, key. And because the blockchain is open and it's transparent, then every time someone donates to that address, uh, you'll see it on the blockchain. So you'll know exactly how much money I made by having that donation address. Uh, and then if I turn around and spend it, uh, if you can identify who I'm sending the money to, so if you see me, you know, send it to Expedia and you're like, oh, that address belongs to Expedia, then you know sort of what I'm doing with my money. Um, so that's a lot more invasive and it's all in the public eye. It's like you don't even have to be the bank. Like the bank has a lot of information about you, but here it's in the public. Um, so anyways, there, there's a lot of efforts at increasing anonymity. There's a few efforts also at reducing anonymity. Uh, or adding true identities to the blockchain as well. So maybe you want to just get rid of the pseudonymity altogether and have, you know, when you look at a transaction, know that that's Jeremy Clark's account as opposed to some generic public key uh, who you don't know who it belongs to. Um, so anyways, with anonymity, there's a lot you can do in Bitcoin itself. There's little protocols you can run that allow you to kind of swap your Bitcoin uh, with other people's Bitcoin so that you end up with the same amount of Bitcoin, you just end up with different UTXOs. Uh, so you kind of lose uh, which UTXO belongs to which person. Um, but anyways, uh, anonymity is, is, is definitely something of interest into a lot of these uh, sort of alternatives or improvements uh, to Bitcoin. Uh, there's a bunch of people who make tweaks to the economics uh, or the finance is probably a better term. Um, so in particular, Bitcoin has this inflation schedule where it introduces new Bitcoin at a certain rate. It's capped at 21 million. Uh, it halves uh, every so often uh, in terms of blocks. And so all of that, uh, we'll, we'll just call in general, it's inflation schedule. Uh, so how does the, the new money come into circulation? And so there's a lot of people who think they could do the economics better. Maybe uh, the, the resulting coin would be less volatile or, or that type of thing. Uh, in some cases, this is actually dynamic. Uh, so it's looking at certain market conditions or even external factors like what the exchange rate is in order to adjust the inflation schedule. Um, and um, OK, OK, so these are the, the main sort of three categories. And then there's one other major, major category. Uh, so the major category here is where we're eventually going to go is we want to change the functionality of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is great for transactions. It turns out it's not the only thing. Uh, so we're going to do a, a bit of a dive into this, but uh, it turns out that Bitcoin is for transactions. But what are some other things, other use cases where having this mechanism of a blockchain. Uh, in particular, transactions are added, they're validated by all the nodes. It's append only, you can't go back and change things. There's a consensus across the network. All these properties of Bitcoin that apply to transactions could potentially apply to other kinds of things that you might want to do. Other more, first off, you can just start thinking about could we do more complicated transactions? So there's still transactions, but they're they're a little more complicated, right? Like uh, money moves if if this one condition holds or this other condition holds, right? It's signed by this person or it's signed by this other person, right? Or 
Uh, we're going to lock money up. If someone comes and claims it in 30 days, then, uh, then they can claim it. And if they don't, then it goes back to the person who sent it in. Okay. So these are all like sort of transaction like um, sounding things, but it turns out, uh, so the, sh the, the short answer here is that you can actually do arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily complicated things on a blockchain and have the blockchain enforce uh, the correct execution of them. Um, so in the most general case, uh, when we start expanding transactions and make them kind of broader, we sometimes call them smart transactions or smart contracts is, is a term that was used. Uh, earlier so these are sort of more verbose transactions and if you want to really push it uh, sometimes we use the term decentralized apps to give the notion that it's actually an application that's running on a blockchain with all the rules of a blockchain um, so these are sometimes called dApps for short okay and uh, we're going to talk about of all the Bitcoin alternatives there's lots that are really interesting um, but we, we just don't have time, unfortunately, to talk about all the different things that you can do in these spaces. Uh, so the one space I want to zoom in is this functionality. And we're going to talk about one Bitcoin alternative in particular that's called Ethereum. And Ethereum um, is it's really here. Uh, so this is Ethereum. Its main contribution is allowing you to write very verbose uh, smart contracts or decentralized apps on a blockchain infrastructure. Uh, that can do arbitrary things okay They're, they can't do everything i want to be careful I, I use the term arbitrary very specifically um so they're very generic uh they're very general you can they capture a lot of functionality but there are limitations to them as well and, and we'll go through all of those okay now if you're going to go and you're going to change uh lots of things about the blockchain as ethereum does you can also make tweaks up here okay so there's nothing stopping you from from tweaking these other types of things as well so uh, Ethereum does have a different uh, financial uh, inflation schedule. Uh, first off, how the coins came into existence in the first place was different. Um, and how it inflates is kind of similar to Bitcoin. Uh, on the anonymity side, it's generally the same as Bitcoin. Uh, so there's a bunch of keys. You don't necessarily know who a key belongs to, but you can see um, all the transactions that are, are using the same key can get linked together. Um, in terms of the consensus mechanism, uh, they decrease the interval time. Uh, so they, it, they take it down to, uh, for, for weird reasons, it's hard to get a, a good answer on how long it takes, but somewhere between like 13 and 17 seconds. Um, so that's a huge drop from 10 minutes. We're now talking, you know, tens of seconds instead of tens of minutes. Um, and it is proof of work based in its current iteration. Uh, but they're very, very interested, and they've, they've employed it. When I'm recording these lectures, it, this may have all changed, but at least on their test networks, uh, they're testing out an alternative that doesn't use proof of work that's based on something called proof of stake uh, instead. So uh, they, they are interested in, in making tweaks here as well. Okay, um, so that's uh, so the Ethereum project. And Ethereum is a category of uh, improvements to Bitcoin that we call an altcoin. So altcoin just means it has its own blockchain. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin. But because it uses a blockchain, we kind of consider it an alternative. Um, this, you know, this term sort of fallen out of favor now. I don't know if I would call Ethereum an altcoin per se. When it first came out, it, you know, everyone was thinking everything was an alternative to Bitcoin. Now, blockchain is such a big space, uh, and there's lots of different technologies in there that that not everyone people don't relate it back to Bitcoin all the time now. Um, but anyways, I, I'll use the term altcoin anyways because I want to distinguish it from a few other options you could do. So let's say that you just didn't like the interval time. You liked everything about Bitcoin, but you thought it should be five minutes instead of 10 minutes. Do you really have to go off on the side and start your own blockchain? Uh, is, there, is there other things that you could do instead? Um, and so it turns out that there, there are a few things that you could do. Uh, so one thing that you could do is you could just fork off of Bitcoin's blockchain. Okay, so you have Bitcoin and it's going along and you say, okay, at this point forward, we're going to change the rules. We're going to have our own network over here and they're playing by some different set of rules. 
uh, than, than Bitcoin itself. And of course, lots of people will still be doing Bitcoin. And so um, the, the Bitcoin block word well, the Bit Bitcoin blockchain will will continue, okay? And this isn't a fork where you're looking at the longest chain. What you're doing is you're looking at the longest chain that extends this, that really extends this block, since this is the block that changes the rules. Uh, you're looking at the longest chain under these sets of rules, okay? So it's not a fork that gets resolved. This is uh, what's sometimes called a hard fork, uh, where this fork will be maintained forever, okay? So you have uh, different rules. And this can create lots of weird scenarios. For example, if you own Bitcoin that were given to you on this block here, then after the fork, if you didn't spend it in the ensuing blocks, then you actually own the same Bitcoin. It's a UTXO under this system, and it's also a UTXO under this system as well. Um, and so you kind of you kind of double your your Bitcoin. So this has happened in the past. Uh, so there's one probably the most significant one to date uh, by the time I record this is something called Bitcoin Cash, uh, where they didn't like the rules of Bitcoin, so they changed them and they just went off in their own direction. And so everyone who owned Bitcoin before this fork now owns, they still own their Bitcoin because Bitcoin's continuing, but there's this other uh, sort of chain uh, that's operating under Bitcoin Cash's rule. And so they also own Bitcoin Cash as well. Um, so that's a different uh, approach. Uh, to changing rules. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, you can sort of do your own chain off on the side and it occasionally kind of write it back into Bitcoin's chain. So Bitcoin will, uh, Bitcoin allows you to write arbitrary data into it now. Uh, there's a, an operation called op return that allows that. And so uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's a lot to be said. Uh, but I'm just going to mention it just so that, that you'll hear this term probably, but uh, that's what I'm describing is called side chains. Okay. Um, another thing you can do is if you have an altcoin, uh, you could have your own blockchain. Okay. And what that means is that miners are going to have to choose between mining on Bitcoin, mining on your new altcoin, or mining on the thousands of other altcoins that people have proposed. OK, but there is a way to kind of standardize the proof of work. So you can say, well, Bitcoin's using a certain kind of proof of work. It'd be really cool if we um, if we could somehow use we could somehow make our proof of work similar enough so that people that were mining on Bitcoin could uh, also mine on our chain sort of at the same time. So so whatever work they're doing to try and solve Bitcoin puzzles will also work to solve our puzzles as well. Um, and so anyways, it, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but there is this technique called merge mining uh, where you can start an alternative coin and you can have people that sort of are able to mine on more than one coin at once because the puzzles are sort of aligned. And in this case, there is a very clear um, relationship where Bitcoin in this case would be the uh, sort of the parental coin. And all these, the coins that are being merged mine are sort of subsidiaries of Bitcoin. So they're, they're, they're aware of what Bitcoin's doing, but Bitcoin is not aware of what they're doing. Um, so it's, it's a very submissive sort of relationship that your coin has to Bitcoin. Uh, but anyways, it has certain benefits. Uh, so people have looked at it. There's also, it introduces some attacks. Um, and, and so anyways, it's, a, it's, a, it's an alternative to doing an altcoin where you can at least try and uh, rec recuperate some of the uh, computational work that's already going into Bitcoin and, and try and use it for your own coin. 